You take care. So now we are recorded. Yeah. So we have to take care. <laughs> <laughs> So just let me know when uh, everyone is ready. Okay, um, we actually have 30 participants online right now and four in the classroom. Okay. So, yeah, I don't oh, know. We can, we can wait uh, five minutes more if you want. Five minutes more, I think, yes. Yeah, 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 we, we have time. Oh, I forgot to tell you that I have one of my colleagues also who will uh, who is attending the training. So her name is Melanie. Mel Melanie, I don't know if you if you asked here. Uh, Melanie was in the class in the morning. Yes. Not here right now. Not yeah, she she's she's here now. Yes. I'm here. She's yeah. Here. So she will be observer for, for the training during the yes. two days. Yes. Uh, and Melanie, if you just want to say a few words about uh, who you are. Um yes. So hi everybody. I'm Melanie and I'm working for WellBees as a consultant in uh, human factors. And uh, I'll also do trainings with uh, Philip. So uh, mm. this is my first uh, training um, with uh, with VNA. So I'm only an observer, but uh, maybe uh, in the future I uh, I will uh, I will help Philip to uh, to do this training. Mm. Oh yes, hopefully okay. yes. <laughs> nice to meet you, Melanie. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> well, because nice Melanie, to meet you, Melanie. Yeah, Welcome, Melanie, loves Melanie. To, Melanie loves to wake up at two in the morning. Yes. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> 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 Uh, Philip, we have 37 joined already and actually six in the class. So you, yeah, you're free to start if you would like. Okay. Yeah, I think okay. they, a little bit is okay. They okay. No problem. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. And uh, now we are going to uh, continue uh, on the data collection, uh, talking about uh, interview, uh, because as I told you, uh, uh, nearly all the investigation at some point rely on interview. You know, at some point, you need to interview uh, people to get so, especially some uh, information on human factors. Oh, can you see my slide? Because I, uh, I'm not uh, yes. sure. That data collection, right? Interview no. and uh, connecting, and uh, this should be the next slide. So I don't uh, think. Can you perception a bottom up and bottom down? Oh, person? okay. Con connecting an interview, right? Uh, no, perception. Right now I'm looking at perception. Oh, that's strange. So it's frozen, I guess. Okay, so I, I need to. Reset it. 
Okay. Okay. And no, does it change? Uh, it's it's pretty small, so it's not the full screen. Oh, okay. So I need to shift. And no. Yes. Is it full screen? Yeah. Yes. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Okay. Uh, let me just move this. Okay. Uh, 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 um. Okay, so yeah, uh, I, yeah, I was just telling that uh, nearly all investigation rely on interviews. So we need uh, uh, in, the, in the course of uh, the investigation to collect uh, interview data. So this is very important. Uh, and also uh, why we uh, have decided to, to spend some time on interview today is that many investigators sometimes it tend to conduct poor interview because they do not re really recognize that interviews require um, specific skills. You know, we just believe that uh, interviewing uh, someone is just asking question, very straightforward question, and we do not recognize all the difficulties in doing interview. You know, I, I'm teacher at the university in psychology, and we spend a lot of years uh, training students doing interview. It's really, really uh, technical. And of course, the way you are connecting the interview may totally change the quality of the data collection. So, uh, you know, depending on the type of question, the way you are asking the question may change totally the outcomes of the interview and so the quality of the interview. And of course, at the end, the quality of the uh, investigation. And this is mainly because interviews rely entirely on perception on, and memory. When you're asking someone uh, to tell you about an incident or an, inci an, an accident, you are relying on his or her memory. And we know that memory might be very, um, you know, very fragile. We, 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 we know that memory is influenced by a lot of factors and what people are remembering might be not exactly the reality. Okay, so this is why this is a thing that should be controlled when you are doing an interview. And so interview, uh, to make it simple, is not a simple conversation. It's much beyond than a simple conversation. Uh, and so, of course, we know that uh, especially perception is very much influenced by a lot of things. Uh, can you tell me what do you see on this, uh, uh, on this slide? What do you see? Uh, we cannot see your slide. Oh, oh. We are <laughs> interview. Okay, so again, I need to, I don't know what happened today. <laughs> uh, still not wake up yeah like me <laughs> okay yes but it's not full screen if you can see oh. it, perfect. okay so i need to shift again wow and what yes. about now okay yes. okay great so can you tell me what do you see on this on this slide okay, okay. Mm -hmm. a lady uh, a lady, yeah, a young or old lady? Young, a young lady. A young lady, okay. Chin, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what about the other? Do you see uh, also the young lady? Uh, yeah, young we lady. can see young lady and old woman. Okay, so some of you see a young lady and an old woman, okay? And... Uh, I probably, you know, some of you only can uh, are able only to see the young lady. And so the young lady is here. You see, uh, this is a noise, this is a chin, and this young is lady. the eyes. Okay, this is your young lady. But if you just concentrate here, you will see also an old woman. You will see here the, the mouth of the, of the old woman. Okay. 
And so it means that our perception is based on two kinds of processes, a bottom-up process and a top-down process. So what I mean by bottom-up, I mean that uh, our perception is based on stimulus, on the information which are in the uh, here on the on the uh, on the drawing, okay. So we are interpreting all this drawing like being an old or a young lady, and so what the world sends to our senses, to here, uh, to our eyes. But we have a, a different process, which is uh, called or named as a top down meaning that it's concept dependent, what we are looking for, um, and we mainly perceive what we want to perceive, okay? So what does it mean? It means that when we are looking to something, we are looking to, uh, I mean, the information which are in the, in the drawing, okay? And it, go, it comes to our brain, and in the brain, we are making a perception. But we are also using our memory Okay, and this is what we call the top-down concept. Uh, so it means that based on our pre previous experience, we will, you know, shape a perception. And so this is why, you know, depending on our experience, depending on the, yeah, our expertise on, on something, we may see different things in the environment. And so this is something also we need to take into account when we are doing an investigation, when we are asking someone, you know, what he or she perceive in a specific situation, it might be very uh, different. Uh, and so uh, our perceptions are under different constraints. Uh, we may have constraint uh, due to the, uh, you know, lighting, visibility, the speed, the distance, the duration, the complexity, okay? All of this will change the way we will perceive an information. And it might be also based on our uh, personal uh, feature, like the focus of attention, uh, or stress, or age, if we have Taken so if if we have uh, taken some drug or alcohol, our level of training, our involvement, or even our expectation. You know what we expect from a specific environment. So all of this will change very much how we are perceiving information, and this will be also something that we need to consider when we are asking some question to someone during the the course of an interview. We need to consider that there is a lot of um, influence in the uh, in the perception of anyone, and then we have the memory. We know that uh, the way we are, uh, remember information is also very much influenced by a lot of things. First, it deteriorates over time. So, if you remember some things that happened uh, last week. You know, days after days, the way you will remember will change, and all the details information will tend to uh, uh, to, uh, to to disappear, and so we'll only uh, keep a, a few details uh, in our memory of a past event. And this is also due to the fact that we have a limited capacity for storing information. We, of course, the long-term memory is unlimited, okay? But the short-term memory is limited in uh, the storing. So we need to do some kind of selection. And by doing some selection, what we are remembering is always partial. It's not the full information. We have only some small information. Memory is also a reconstructive process. It means that this is not like, uh, you know, when you are taking a, a picture with your, with your phone, you have all the information. The memory, in the memory, we are reconstructing uh, the information. And so in we, uh, this process, we are shaping our experience based on what we know about the world. And so when we are looking to a complex uh, scene, we are only selecting some information and then rebuilding uh, the information which are shaped based on our experience. And so in essence, all memory is biased. It's not exactly reflecting the reality. 
And so there, is, there was a very good uh, example. Uh, I don't know if you remember the crash of the uh, Boeing 747 in New York in 1996. So the aircraft uh, um, exploded in the sky uh, close to New York. And there was over 250 of the eyewitnesses uh, which described aspect of the event which were directly contradictory contradicted by the physical evidence, meaning that all the witnesses, you know, some aspect of the, of the uh, uh, eyewitnesses were directly contradicted by some physical evidence that comes from the uh, investigator. Okay, so it means that we have to be very careful when we are interviewing uh, people. Uh, it does not mean that we should not use, of course, interview, but we need to consider with care the, uh, the information which are provided by uh, the interview. So in memory, we know that there is several memory errors, what we call a memory errors. It means that our memory is influenced and uh, is uh, providing some wrong information. And so there is three kinds of memory errors. First, incorrectly reconstruct, reconstructing event recollect, recollection. Okay, so that means that the way we are building uh, the memory is wrong. Incorrectly attributing the source of information. Oh, yes, uh, I'm sure that uh, I saw directly this information, but in fact, it was not a direct information, but this was due to someone reporting the information. And so we are wrongly uh, attributing the source of information or falsely believing that events that were not experienced were finally experienced. Okay, so we tend also to fill the hole. You know, when we have a hole in, in the memory, when something is missing in the memory, we tend, you know, to fill the holes. And so people view the event as plausible and they reconstruct a memory which is partially based on a true experience. Okay, so you have a kind of, uh, you have a kind of uh, confusion between something that really happened and something that is believed to happen. Um, and so again, we tend to fill the gaps uh, when something is filling in our memory. And so the brain automatically will fill the gaps. And so what we will remember is sometimes not exactly what happened. So this is why in uh, interview, and uh, I mean, especially in the investigation, we need to use some techniques. And some of these techniques, in fact, comes from the, uh, uh, from the police, because, you know, when the police has to do uh, investigation, they are exactly faced to the same difficulties uh, as we, we are facing when we are doing an investigation for, for safety. And so, for example, interview technique in, in investigation have developed in the area of justice and police. And for example, a number of people have been wrongly convicted of sexual assault crime based on eyewitness evidence. And we have plenty of examples, you know, in different countries where this is something that may happen. And so the witnesses fully believe that the individuals were the one who committed the crime. And so these people have been falsely uh, convicted and prosecuted by uh, the justice. So there is plenty of uh, uh, justice errors uh, which are based on wrong interview or wrong uh, information, uh, data collection uh, during the uh, investigation process. Uh, so to, to go back to the uh, memory uh, errors, we also know that there is what we call bias in the, in the memory. The first one, uh, the first bias is what we call the egocentric bias. Okay, it means that when we remember something, we tend to remember information or situation or even that is very positive for ourselves. You know, we tend to remember like when we when we did an exam uh, to remember having a much higher grade than the real grade. Uh, or when if you are fishing, you know, sometimes you remember to 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 uh, to catch a big fish. While in fact, in the reality, it was a very small fish. Okay, so when we tend to remember something, it tends to serve ourselves or to make ourselves. 
are more positive than the reality. And this is not, this is not bound by purpose. You know, it does not mean that people are lying. Uh, this is something that we need to separate. You know, these people, people are not lying, but the way they are remember events are, uh, are biased. False memory, this is confusion of imagination with memory or confusion of true memories with false memory, okay? So again, we are filling the gaps. When something is missing, we tend to fill the gaps by our own imaginations. And finally, the third one, we already talked about this by, this is the hindsight bias, which is a process where we are filtering memory of past events through the present knowledge. You know, when you know something uh, and when you are after the facts, you are rebuilding things by knowing the end of the story. And by knowing the end of the story, you will, you will have the, uh, the tendency to filter the information just to make it more predictable. And this is, again, a very big bias in the investigative uh, investigation process. So going back to the interview, we know that there is a lot of interviewing biases. Okay, so some kind of errors that may happen during the interview and that will make your interview, uh, the information that you will collect in the course of the interview, uh, the quality of this information very poor and not really uh, usable uh, in the uh, investigation, in, into the safety investigation. For example, we know that there is some interviewer influence. Sometimes the interviewer, not by purpose again, can subtly insinuate false information into their question. You know, you have already the answer into the questions. Uh, and so witnesses make systematic errors as a function of misleading questions. So we have to be very careful in a misleading question. And it was studied by, you know, uh, very, uh, uh, in a very nice experiment, very controlled experiment. And they found that sometime when you are doing interview, the uh, interviewer may influence the interviewee. We have a second bias, which is called the social desirability. Social desirability uh, reflects the tendency of respondents to answer a question in a manner that will be viewed favorably by others. Okay, so uh, when you are responding to a survey or to an interview, we tend to have in the brain uh, a kind of uh, you know representation of how people are expecting or the kind of answers they are expecting from us. Okay, and so be careful because it might be very, um, um, I mean, it may impact very much the quality of your interview. And so this results from two factors, self-deception and other deception. We don't want, when we're answering uh, an interview, we don't want to, um, uh, to deceive uh, the, uh, the, the person who is asking questions. So we tend to answer in a way that we believe will be favorable. And so it has also to be very much controlled. We can't really suppress that, but as, at least we can try to mitigate the effect of this uh, interviewing bias. Uh, and how, how can we do it? By using some you know, very uh, rigorous uh, techniques. So uh, there is now different types of interviewees. So the interviewees is the people who will be interviewee, uh, interviewed. So there is some differences in the stake associated with the findings of an investigation. Of course, if you, if you are interviewing someone who have been directly involved in the accident, these people may think that uh, they will be blamed depending on the type of answer they will uh, provide, okay? So maybe they will be very stressed, they will be very uh, scared or concerned about the results of the investigation. And of course, it will change the way they will answer to you. Um, we may have uh, also differences in the background, in the experience, and so it may affect 
people's ability to understand and respond to the question. So this is a thing you have to consider when you are preparing your, investi your investigation and your interview is to try to consider these two things, you know, the stake, what could be the uh, impact of the interview for the interviewee and the background, the experience uh, of uh, the interviewees. Uh, so there is in fact three kinds of interviewees, you know, three categories uh, with different contribution to the investigation. The first one is uh, the uh, eyewitnesses. So the people who have been uh, witness of the incident or the accident. So in general, these people are external to the event or they might be, I mean, uh, maybe they can be victim of the incident or the accident and they have directly observed the event. Okay, so this is a very, um, it's a very useful source of information even if we have to be very careful. Then we have the operators whose action are the primary focus of the investigation. So the people who have been directly involved in the incident or accident, so it might be the people who did the errors that has produced uh, the incident or the accident, or so it might be the pilot, it might be the, uh, the, uh, the, the cabin crew. And then we have a third category who have uh, the people who are familiar with the critical system element or with uh, the people who have been directly involved, okay? So it might be uh, the managers, it might be uh, people who did the training, uh, it might be some colleagues, it might be the family, you know, all the people who are uh, surrounding uh, the situation and who are familiar with some aspect, some very important aspect of the uh, accident or the incident. So first, the uh, interview, uh, the eyewitnesses. So these eyewitness, eyewitness, eye, <laughs> eyewitnesses, sorry, may have observed features that system recorders did not capture. You know, maybe they heard some noises <clears throat> which are beyond the microphone range. Okay, and this is something which might be very useful. Maybe they smell odors which are not, of course, recorded by any sensor. Maybe they felt some movements. Uh, there is very nice, uh, there is a lot of example where um, a passenger, some, for example, uh, heard the noise on an engine. And so it was very useful to interview these passengers because they heard something which was not recorded by uh, the uh, CVR. Okay. Um, so their uh, information, the information they will provide may enhance or confirm existing information or add information unavailable from other sources. Okay, so they can be used just to validate some other sources of information or they can even add or complete some information which have been not available, like, you know, smell in general, you need to use uh, the uh, direct uh, eyewitnesses. And of course, their willingness to cooperate, because all witnesses will not be, you know, uh, willing to cooperate. Uh, they are very, very, this willingness will be very much influenced by their confidence in the value of the information they can provide. Okay, so they need to be uh, reinforced, encouraged uh, uh, to be. Um, you know, confident enough to provide information. And so they have to be also confident in the way this information will be used by the uh, investigator. And this is something we'll come back uh, later. Then second category, we have uh, the system operator. So what, uh, what I mean by system operator, I, I mean the people who have been directly involved in the incident or accident. So the people who did the errors or the violation. Uh, and so of course they may be able to describe the action and decision during the event and provide of course very helpful background information about the system. Uh, how they uh, perceive the system, what kind of information they are really able to perceive, what they hear, what they what they saw during the uh, uh, during the incident or the uh, accident, um, and of course they may be unable to recall details or have difficulty responding 
response, responding if they feel responsible. So this is why you know uh, they have to be. Uh, uh, it has to be very clear from the beginning that we are not here to blame them. We are here to understand what happened and so to get as much as possible uh, useful information. Uh, and of course, investigators should be aware that the operators can be concerned about, again, the effect of the event on their career. You know, it's never neutral when you are uh, answering to question for uh, an investigation where you have been uh, directly involved, you might be uh, uh, concerned by how the information will be used. Um, okay, and finally, the third category is uh, people who are what we call at the blunt end. You know, uh, we have the sharp end. Sharp end means the people who have been on the field, uh, directly involved in the accident or in the incident. And the blunt end means that people who are not, who are not present, who are not directly involved in the accident, but uh, whose decision may have influence the action of the people who were involved in the incident or in the accident. So it might be the managers, you know, the people who provide some orders to uh, the people who are involved, the designers, the people who have designed the aircraft or some equipment, the trainers, okay? All of these have influenced, may have influenced the condition that led to errors at the sharp end. So again, the sharp end means the people who were uh, directly on the workstation, in the flight deck, or in the cabin if uh, you have an investigation on cabin crew. And of course, uh, these people may also feel responsible for the cause of the event. And so when you are interviewing these people, you have also to consider that these people might be concerned by the consequences of your investigation. And so you have also to make, to make it very clear that there is, uh, you are not in a blame uh, uh, process. So uh, this table uh, summarizes the kind of information you might uh, want to collect uh, depending on these three categories. So for the eyewitness, uh, what you probably want to collect is what they saw, heard, felt, or smelled. Okay, uh, the details of the events that caught their attention, because maybe, you know, what have been uh, in their attention is something which is relevant for the uh, investigation. Um, the time of the day and the location they witness this event. You know, it's very important also when you are asking someone to uh, provide information uh, is to also uh, describe the context in which they were, uh, the, the location, uh, the time of the day, because the lighting might be very different. And so this will also change the way they perceive the information. So don't just ask them to report what they saw, what they heard, but first start by describe the context in which they were eyewitness. And the operator's actions might be also something they have they have some kind of perception on the operator's action. Then we have the operators, so the people who have been directly involved. And so, of course, there is a very long list of information you would like to, uh, uh, to, to collect, like the decisions they have made before the event, you know, what they have in mind, what was their, uh, what we call the situation awareness they had when they made the decision, uh, the time when they made those decisions, the action they took before the event, you know, did they press a button, did they omit to do something, uh, then the outcome and the consequences of the action they took, okay, uh, what kind of information they have on their job, on their task, what, their, what was their level of knowledge of uh, uh, on, on this uh, specific task. What was their knowledge of the company practices and procedures? Here, you don't really want to describe or ask them to describe exactly the company pro practice and procedure. But what you want to know is how much they know about this practice and procedure. Because sometimes it might be very useful to see uh, how much um, you know, these people were knowing what was their, uh, the practice or the, the procedures in the company. 
And then also you maybe uh, want to get some personal information about their health, uh, the change in their family status. And as we said uh, earlier this morning, the rest and sleep prior, uh, the 72 hours, you remember? So all of this information related to their fatigue should be asked directly, if possible, of course, to the people who have been involved. Then for the third category, which is of people who are familiar with some critical system elements, including the people who have been involved. Uh, then here you can collect some duty, sleep, and rest schedules previous to 72 hours. Uh, the opinion expressed towards the job, if uh, you know uh, these people uh, heard that uh, the, uh, the uh, pilot or the cabin crew was not really happy with their job, was not no more motivated or was frustrated. So all, all this kind of information might be useful at some point. Uh, the operator's training and work history. And finally, the operating policies and practices, uh, which, are, uh, which was uh, at the time of the uh, incident or the uh, accident. Okay, so now what, what we are going to see is a few techniques, you know, to uh, do your interview, because uh, in the uh, research, uh, there was a lot of uh, techniques which have been developed, which can be used for police uh, investigation, but also for safety investigation. So there was a lot of uh, techniques, and uh, I will just uh, cite three, and I, I will not go into detail of all of these techniques. It will, it will uh, require a lot of time, but we have what we call the cognitive interview. So I, I guess you are all aware of what means cognitive. Uh, so cognitive is the way we are processing information. So it's, it's a part of psychology. And so in cognitive psychology, we are studying how uh, an individual is processing information. So it covers perception, communication, interpretation, decision-making, execution of the action, okay? And so cognitive interview will be some kind of interviews that will try to really describe all uh, what happened in the mind, you know, in the brain of someone when he or she is making a decision. Uh, the second technique is what we call the conversation management uh, and the peace technique. So I will explain you uh, what it is. And we have also the elicitation interview. It has been developed by a famous uh, researcher in France, which really go very uh, deep into the um, events and situation to help people really to elicit what, they, uh, what happened in the situation. And I will then give you a few general guidelines, you know, that you should use when you are preparing your interview uh, to make sure that your interview will be uh, conducted in, a, in an appropriate manner. So first, the cognitive interview. So basic, the basic principle of the cognitive interview is based on what we call in psychology, the encoding. So encoding, uh, what does it mean? It means that when you have a new information that comes to you, and when you want to remember this information, when you want to store this information, the information will not be stored. Um, I mean, uh, you, you will not store only the information, but you will also store all the context of this information. And this will help you to remember the information more easily. Okay. Uh, and so, you probably know, I don't know, maybe uh, if you know the Madeleine de Proust effect. Madeleine de Proust, so Proust is a very famous writer in France. And so Proust was describing uh, a story uh, to a friend and he was saying, oh yeah, sometime, you know, I ate uh, a Madeleine. So a Madeleine, I don't know if you know the French cooking, but Madeleine is a very French uh, and very famous uh, uh, cake in France. Okay, so it's a small cake, very, very good, very tasty. If, if, if we can come back in Vietnam, I will bring you some uh, Madeleine. This is very, very good cake. <laughs> and so Proust was saying that when he ate, he was adult, okay, and when the taste of the Madeleine helped you to remember very suddenly 
very old memory. Oh, yes. I, uh, suddenly, I remember that my, my mom was preparing the cake. And uh, this is what happened when I was a child, and so on and so on. So this is what we call the Madeleine de Proust effect. It means that suddenly, when you are faced with something, it might be a smell, it can be a taste, it can be uh, you know the smell of a perfume. Suddenly, you will remember a lot of information. Have you been faced uh, already to a Madeleine de Proust effect? A lot of time. Uh, yeah, a lot of time. Yeah, yeah. And maybe this is something that happens every day, in fact. You know, uh, it might be uh, also a sound, a music. You know, music is very, uh, is, is a very good example. Sometimes you, you heard at the radio a music and suddenly you remember, I don't know, your first uh, girlfriend. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> a very nice memory. And so music, uh, you know, uh, so which is a cue. Uh, help you to remember something. And so it means that we have, uh, and so this is a principle of encoding, okay? And we have also another aspect, which is a multi-component view of memory. What does it mean? It means that when we are storing information in the brain, it's not like, uh, uh, you know, uh, recording. When you are recording like uh, the training today, you know, with Zoom, it will be exactly all the world that I told you will be in the recording, okay? But no, memory is not working like a recorder. Uh, so we don't have the memory trace, what we call the memory trace, uh, meaning the trace in the brain, is not a linear representation of the original event. It's sort of a kind of photocopy, you know, but it's more complex. And so that means that to access to this information, there is different routes to go to this information, okay? And so this is why, as I, I will show you, uh, we need to use different techniques to go uh, directly or as much as possible directly to uh, the information uh, to be uh, remembered. So this is why we call, uh, we use, sorry, some, uh, uh, what we call some retrieval rules, okay? We call it also mnemonics. You, probably you know the, the terms mnemonics, you know? Uh, it's a way to remember something. Uh, I don't know when you want to remember that you, I don't know, you, you have to go to the supermarket uh, to do some uh, shoppings, and then you will use some kind of techniques to remember everything that you have to remember, okay? Of course, if you don't have something to write down, because normally we will use our, our phone or a paper, you know, a piece of paper to write it down, but this is not memory. But if we don't have, you know, these tools, we use some strategies uh, to uh, be sure to uh, not forget something. And so these uh, retrieval rules, uh, we have four rules that I will describe very quickly. We have the mental reinstatement, I will explain you. We have in-depth reporting. We are describing the TBR. So TBR is to be remember events in several orders and reporting the TBR event from different perspectives. Okay, so I will explain you very quickly this kind of techniques. And this technique should be used whenever you are doing interview, you know, to be sure that uh, the person will be able to remember as much as possible. And you, I, I mean, I've been using it very much uh, in, in the past and people sometimes are very surprised. Oh, I, I did not realize that I would be able to remember so much things. But in fact, you know, everything in, is in the memory somewhere, but here these techniques are just meant to help people uh, to uh, be able, you know, to pick these uh, memories. So first rules, mental reinstatement of environmental and personal context. So here the idea is to help the participant, is to help the participant to mentally revisit to re the remember, uh, the to be remember events, okay? Uh, so the interviewer may ask them to form a mental picture of the environment in which they witnesses the event. So you will ask, for example, okay, can you describe me uh, what was, uh, I mean, what was the place where you were, uh, where you were when, when the uh, event happened? What was the uh, lighting? What was the noise? What was the temperature? So 
everything you know that uh, uh, surrounded the event. And this will help, you know, it's based on the uh, coding, on coding principle, it will help to go back to the uh, information to be remembered. This is really, this is helps to push the Madeleine de Proust uh, effect. And so the participant is also asked to revisit their personal mental state, where you stress, where you happy, where you, so the kind of emotion, because I forgot to tell you also that all the memories is very much linked with emotion. You know, uh, it's much more easy to remember something when it has been associated with a negative or positive emotion. And in fact, in the brain, you know, the memory, I don't know if you know where is the memory, uh, I mean, uh, like your hard disk in the, in the brain, the hard disks are located in the side uh, part of the brain, okay? From the right, uh, oh, you are drawing nice, uh, nice thing. <laughs> Uh, so it okay. So we, are, we have uh, this hard disk on the right side and on the left side of the brain. And what we find also in this part of the brain is uh, the location of the emotion. Okay, so emotion and memory in the brain are very close, very much linked. Um, okay. Okay. So no second techniques in-depth reporting. So here we encourage uh, the, uh, the interviewer, encourage reporting of every single detail. Even if we think that this is just a detail and maybe you, you this is the, thing, the kind of things you have seen in uh, movies, you know, at the cinema, when you are looking to a policeman who are trying to get some information and normally he encourage uh, the uh, eyewitness uh, to really report every single detail. So it has to be really detailed. Don't go directly to the incident, but really try to describe, okay, don't go directly to the incident. I would, I would like you to describe everything what happened before in very much detail, okay? And so this step is very important for two reasons. So the, pa the participant may only initially report what information that they assume to be important. And so it means this is uh, meant to avoid you know, the selection effect. And so this is why you really need to help the interviewee to report every single detail, because sometimes the most important aspect are in the detail and not in what you know, the person believe uh, is uh, really important. And so recalling partial details may also lead to subsequent recall of additional uh, relevant information. So all, again, like a little bit like the Madeleine de Proust effect, you know, from one detail, you will go directly to another thing that you thought was totally uh, forgotten. Okay, so this is also a very good way to, um, get information from, uh, from the memory. Then uh, we should ask also the participant or, you know, the people we, we interviewed to describe the event in several orders, not using only, you know, uh, the chronological order, but so the, the participant create the narrative of the event. And so, uh, the, 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 the participant, the person who is interviewee, should be encouraged to start the narrative from a point that is different from the initial starting point. Okay, so you tell me about the incident from the beginning to the end. No, I would like you to tell me about the event from the end or maybe from the middle, okay? And so taking different perspective, time perspective, will also give opportunity to have new information to be recalled. And I can tell you it works very well. You know, when you, when you manage well these uh, rules, it really helps uh, the people to remember something that was apparently lost in their brain. And finally, uh, reporting the event from different perspective here, you ask people uh, to report the event from several different, different perspectives. Okay, no. You were facing the event. No, let's imagine what could be seen from a different perspective. Okay, from the side, from the back, uh, from the uh, 
from the top or from the bottom. Okay, and this will also help uh, people to remember some uh, information. Okay, so just to recap, we have four rules. Okay, that you should use as much as possible when you are doing uh, investigation, mental reinstatement, in-depth reporting, describing the uh, event in different orders or several orders, and reporting the event from different perspectives. Okay, so we don't have really time to practice that, and it's very difficult because we are online. But maybe I would like you to give me uh, just uh, a few explanations on these four rules, okay? J just to, to be sure that you understood the rule correctly, okay? So can you tell me, can someone tell me what means mental reinstatement of the environmental and personal context? The first rule, can you tell me what it means? Just to be sure that you understood everything. Yeah? Can someone tell me what, what means the first rule? I know that you are supposed to sleep now, but... Uh... <laughs> uh, yes, it does mean that uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can receive or, or you can uh, retravel all the memories by the environment around you. For example, when, when you want to remember something in the past, uh, like in your example, before that you want to, uh, uh, that is something happened in the supermarket maybe a years ago, and now you just, you have put on your short term memory, so you just come back to that uh, supermarket and try to uh, to act the same like, uh, that, that you did a years ago and try to recall everything back. And maybe in some, uh, in, in, in some circumstances, you, you might get something back. And that that could uh, help uh, for the interview interviewer to get get some information. Yes, that, that's correct. Exactly. Yes, yeah. The idea really is try to you know push people to um, go back in uh, in the same environment. Of course, mentally, you know, by uh, by just uh, trying to remember exactly the noise. Uh, uh, the uh, the lighting, you know, everything that create uh, some uh, state, also in their emotion. So try to put them back into the situation, and this will help them to remember, you know, uh, much more information. So yeah, first thing is very good. Second rule: can tell can someone tell me what means in depth reporting? It it's quite easy. What, what are you supposed to do when you are doing in-depth reporting? This means that uh, you report in detail, more detail. Exactly, yes. You ask people, the interviewee, to uh, give you uh, as much as detail, even if they believe that the, this is really a detail. You know, it's not, it's not really important to explain the incident or the accident. But all this detail will help you know, the people also to get new information or to have additional information. So, yeah, very important rules. Then describing the TBA event in several orders. So what does it mean? It's quite uh, straightforward. Uh, yeah, it's to start uh, investigating, in, start inquiring right from the initial point, from the time it happened. Yeah. To be remembered right from in the several minutes it's right from the beginning right start start talking about right from the beginning of the incident yeah yeah and yeah and the idea here is to encourage people maybe to do to 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 report the event from the beginning to the end but then to ask people also to do it uh, in a different order okay we will now start by the end and then you will describe background or maybe we will start from the middle, from this specific event. And so you will tell me more about the event. So you see, like uh, if you have exactly like a video, you know, if you are going on YouTube, you are on the video and you may start the video from the end, from the beginning, you know, backward, uh, from the middle. And this will be a very useful way to remember new information. Because again, as I told you, uh, memory, trace is not linear, 
you know it's not stored in the brain from the beginning from the end it's not like on a computer it's much more complex the brain is much more complex than a computer and then reporting the tba even from different perspectives uh, it goes a little bit in the same direction as the rule number three is to try to push the people to look at the event, like uh, you know, also when if you if you are I don't know in a movie scene, you know, and you may take, you may use a camera from different perspective, okay. And so here you will ask people to report the event in a different from a different perspective, you know, from different location uh, when they are looking to the event, okay. If you are using these four rules, I can tell you that it will be very helpful to get new information, additional information, and sometimes, you know, something that was absolutely not obvious. Okay, and this is what you are looking when you are doing investigation, of course, is to go beyond the, uh, the, uh, the appearance. Okay, very good. Uh, so you are not too sleepy, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> Good news. <laughs> okay, now some uh, uh, aspect on uh, uh, still in, on cognitive interview. In general, we um, an interview should last around one hour. You know, uh, if you go beyond one hour, it might be very tiring or very boring for for the participant. So try to keep. Uh, at least or around one hours for the interview. Um, it's it's I mean it, it's just an average. It does not mean that it should be a sharp one hour, but one hour is more or less you know uh, the time you should spend in the interview. First, you need to make an introduction to establish a witness interviewer's relationship. We'll go back on that later, but you know this is very important not to start the interview by saying, "Okay, please ask, tell me what happened." <laughs> Well, no, you're, you're not in the police uh, uh, interrogation, okay? But you need, of course, to create a, a good climate. And the, the way you will introduce may change totally the way the, interviewing, the interview will be done, okay? So uh, the first perception for the interviewee will be very, uh, will be a key aspect uh, for the quality of the interview. Then, and it might be surprising for you, you should introduce the retrieval rules. You know, you, you remember the four rules uh, I told you, this is very important that you share with the interviewee these rules. Why? Because otherwise it might be very surprising. Wow, why these people are asking me to uh, do it in different orders? Why these people are asking me to give so much details? It's very, very suspicious, okay? So you need to understand exactly as I told you today, why we will use these rules and what is the purpose of the rules. And the purpose of the rule, again, is to help the people to get more information from their brain. Okay, so to avoid them to be surprised or even uh, worst to be scared by the interview. Uh, then during the narrative production, and this might be sometimes very difficult, the interviewer should be, you know, try to think a little bit ahead, should anticipate what should be done in the remainder of the interview. Okay, okay, so no, I get this information, no. I need to think about the next step in my interview. So this is very important because it's always dynamic because depending on the way the interviewee will give you some information, you may change a little bit your uh, strategy. Uh, so the, then the, the interviewer guides the witness through several uh, representation, uh, of course, so you need really, you know, to guide, to support uh, the people. And then the end of interview, you need, of course, to conclude, you need to, uh, of course, thank uh, the interviewee for uh, being uh, involved in the uh, interview. You need also to give uh, some kind of information on the follow-up, how this information will be used in the course of the investigation process. This is also very important. Okay, yeah, and I, I, will, give more, I will give you more detail on that. So 
uh, these cognitive interviews have been found to be uh, very useful and very efficient. You know, it has been validated in some experiment. So here, what they did, it was a, a very interesting experiment. It was more for police investigation, but it, it may, of course, apply for safety investigation. So here, the participants saw a simulated crime scene, OK? And there was successive interviews. Either there was using a traditional interview, so meaning that they did not use the four rules I gave you, and they compared that with cognitive interview using the rules I just gave you, okay, the four rules. And they found that the cognitive interview, so the one I just explained to you, elicit, so it means that it, uh, it, 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 it brings between 35 to 60% more information. So that means that the cognitive interview was much more efficient to provide information, useful information, compared to the traditional interview, okay? And so, of course, there is a lot of, uh, I mean, the application of this cognitive interview is very wide, of course, for accident investigation, but it might be also for police investigation and for also medical interview, because sometimes, you know, when you are doctors at the hospital, uh, you want to get some information. And so the medical interview has, is, very, is a very important aspect of the diagnosis. Okay, so of course, there is a few limitations. First, it's much more difficult than traditional interview. Why? Because you need to be trained. Okay, normally, if we will be in the, I mean, in the real, uh, in the real, uh, in the real uh, life, if, 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 I, if I can come to Vietnam to do the training, we could do, you know, this, uh, some exercise. It's very difficult to do it uh, online. But I can tell you that, of course, it takes more time uh, to be really trained and to manage these uh, techniques, but it's very efficient. You know, the, uh, the cost benefit is very, uh, is very positive. Uh, of course, it's useful only if you have eyewitness, of course, but by, by definition. And still, it's still vulnerable to desirability bias. You remember desirability bias? What does it mean? What, what means desirability bias? Do you remember what, what, does, what does it mean? <laughs> you remember, I told you that uh, in interview, you have different bias, so you, you have different influence which might be negative for the quality of your interview, and was was the desirability bias. Hmm. You don't remember? So desirability bias means that when you are interviewing someone, uh, the people, you, the individuals that you are interviewing will have a tendency to respond in a way that he or she believe will be more favorable, you know, or the way that, um, in a way that uh, they believe you will expect the answer, okay? So they have a kind of uh, feeling of what you are expecting from them, and so they will try to comply with this expectation. Okay, they will try to give you information that the things you are expecting from you. Okay, so this is what we call desirability bias, which might be a, a, a big issue when you are doing uh, interviews. So, now a few um, general guidelines. Uh, so, something uh, like something like when you interview someone, and you always think everything good to him or to her. Before yeah. well, you you expect is yeah. it correct? For yeah, example, exactly. I, I interview someone, but in your mind, in our mind, always think everything is good from her or from him. Yeah. When yeah. you expect, is it correct? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you you answer in a way that you believe. Okay, uh, this is the way. Uh, these people uh, is expecting. So it doesn't mean that this the people are lying. 
It's absolutely yeah. not a, a yeah. lie, you know. This is not yeah. done by purpose. This is something which is unconscious. Yeah. But it will, of course, influence the, the quality mm -hmm. of the data you will get at the end. Yeah. Okay. Especially, and this desirability bias is even stronger, of course, if a manager, uh, if the interviewer is a manager, you know, because yeah. if you have a, a hierarchy uh, in the, uh, between the interviewer and the interviewee, this desirability bias will be even stronger because you will always want to, uh, you know, to make your manager happy. <laughs> yes, yeah, so okay. something like the manager report him or her something wrong. But in your opinion, in deep in your heart, you think that it never happened to her. He's <laughs> yes. always okay or something. Yeah. 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 So we, it means that we have to have a limitation when you interview. With uh, someone, exactly. you think so? Yeah, okay. Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's difficult, you know, to totally suppress this because, I mean, this is a part of human, you know, so we can't really change human. But at least when you are interpreting your data, you need to take into account that. You need to take into account that this might have played a role in the, uh, in the interview. And so I can give you a few tips, you know, also to try to improve the quality of your interview. First things, an interview is not an interrogation. You know, you are not policeman. I guess you are not policeman. In, I mean, all of you are not policeman, you are, but you are more interested in doing safety investigation. So again, you are not here to judge. And so this has to be it has to be made clear very uh, at the very beginning from the interview, okay? So the mental state of witness should be taken into account because these people maybe are suffering from stress, from trauma, or even from medi medical condition, okay? Especially if they have been involved directly in the incident because when you are... I mean, when you have been involved in an incident, and we all know what may happen uh, in this case, there is a lot of emotion, you know? And so the mental state of the people who are, who have been, uh, who are interviewed is to be uh, considered. Um, okay, sometimes the family members of the witnesses also, or the colleagues may help incident investigation by offering insight on personality, character traits, and behavior, okay? So it might be also useful when you are preparing your interview to know more about, you know, the people you are, you are going to interview. Uh, is these people shy? Uh, is these people uh, stress, uh, anxious? You know, so all this kind of information, background information before might be very useful to help you to prepare the information because you will not do the interview exactly in the same way depending on the individual and depending on these uh, features. Uh, okay, so then statements. What you need to state to the interview V, the investigator must inform witness about the objective of collecting their statement, which is mainly helping in understanding causes and preventing future accidents. Again, you know, uh, use a blame-free approach. And this is very important to, you know, uh, make the interview more comfortable and to answer really honestly uh, to your questions. So witness should be isolated from one another. You, you probably, you, you have seen that in a, in a police movie uh, at the cinema. Uh, you know, it's very important when you have several witnesses not to put them together. You know, uh, in the waiting room, if you are doing that, they will all discuss. And then they will not lie. If they don't something, they will leave. Yes, hello? Oh no, sorry. Uh, there was a glitch in the system. Oh. Yes, yes uh, please. Yeah, there was a glitch. So can you repeat again, please? Ah, yes. Okay, my internet connection was unstable for, yeah, for, for, for a short while. Can you hear me well now? Yeah, that's fine now. 
Okay, perfect. So yeah, what, what, what I was uh, telling you is that when you have different witnesses, you need to isolate them, not putting them together in the same room while waiting to be interviewed. Okay, you need to isolate them. Otherwise, they will have a tendency to discuss. And if they don't remember something, they will use what they heard from other witnesses. Okay, so try to isolate them as much as possible. And of course, something which I, I forgot to tell you is that you need to do the interview as quick as possible after the incident. Of course, because again, um, memory, when we don't remember something, we will use our imagination to fill the gaps. So of course, the more time you have between the incident and the interview, the more we will use our imagination, okay? Uh, good. So now we have a different type of questions, you know, and this is what we also learn. We, we teach to our uh, students when uh, they are doing psychology. We have different kind of question in interview. First, you may have general question. We, we call it open ended question. OK, so open ended question. It does. It, what does it mean? It means that you don't have in the question some um, specific uh, type of answer. You know, what did you see? What can you recall? Can you tell me more about that? OK, so this is very general. There is no suggestion in the in the question of the kind of answer you are uh, uh, expecting. OK, which is really different to say, what did you see? Or did you see a signal? OK, or did you see a light? Or did you hear a noise? OK, you see the difference between an open-ended open -ended question or uh, a specific question, as we'll see uh, just after. Directed question. So here you are really focusing on a specific subject but be careful without biasing the answer. Did you notice any light on the display? Okay, which is different from, and this is what, what we are going to see after, you know, uh, did you notice the red light? You, you see the difference between did you notice any light or did you see uh, the red light? Okay, when you are asking, did you see the red light, you are already providing the answer in the question. So this is what we call a leading question. And this is, I will go back on that. Uh, then we have specific questions needed for specific information. Did you notice any light on the, on the display? If yes, what color was the light? Because here you really want to see or to, uh, to, 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 to ensure that uh, the people have seen a light and what kind of color they have seen on the light. Summary question, very important. Uh, you know, when you are doing the interview, it might be long, you know, one hour might be very, very long. And sometimes you need to, uh, I mean, to recap, to summarize, because it will help also the uh, interviewee uh, to be sure that he did not forget something. So to help witnesses to organize their thought and draw attention to possible additional information, you need to restate what you think the witness told you in your own words. OK, so if I'm not wrong, you tell me that uh, you, uh, you were uh, starting your duty. And when you, once you started your duty, uh, you heard a big noise. And uh, from that, you did that, and so, and so on, and so on. OK, so you do a kind of small summary, and you will ask the interviewee to confirm, you know, uh, that it was really what uh, they have in their in their mind. Okay, and very often you will be surprised to see, oh yeah, yeah, this is true. But no, uh, it it's just remember it. It just remind me that I forgot to tell you this and this. Okay, so these summary questions are very important to get additional information. Okay, leading question. So be careful because. We should not use leading question. You should avoid as much as possible uh, to use leading question. A leading question means that you have more or less the answer in the question. So they contain or imply the desired answer. And it will 
encourage very much the, uh, the, the famous, you know, desirability bias. So once you ask a, a leading question, you have suggested what the witness is supposed to have seen. Was a red light flashing, you know? Oh, oh yes, maybe, maybe I forgot, but uh, as you tell me, yes, it was probably a red light flashing, okay? So this is something you absolutely need to avoid when you are doing your interview. Okay, sometimes you may use uh, some techniques that do not require question because often when we talk about uh, interview, we think that we always need to ask questions. Sometimes, no, you don't need really to ask some uh, specific question. So, uh, for example, to keep a witness talking, you just say something like, mm -hmm, oh, really, or continue, you know? So you try to encourage by a few words or even your attitude to try to add information, okay? You may also mirror or echo the witness comment. You should repeat what the witness said without agreeing or disagreeing, you know? You should be always neutral as much as possible. Okay, so you say you saw smoke coming from the cabin, so you, 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 you try to do like a mirror, you know, like an echo, and so you will see that, uh, and you will be sure that uh, uh, the interviewee has really this uh, in them. Okay, uh, something that very often is forgotten is that you need to prepare the, your interview. You know, you can just come in the room and say, okay, I will start my interview without thinking before how you will uh, manage your interview. So you need to, prepare your question in advance. Maybe sometime you will change in the course of the interview, but mostly you need to have a kind, you know, of structure. Uh, you need to have some steps in your interview and you have to write down everything that you don't want to forget. So this is very important. You need to prepare your interview and sometimes it may last even, I mean, I don't, I don't know if, if the interview lasts one hour, maybe the preparation time might be the double, you know, sometimes for one hour of interview, it need, you need to, to, to use two hours of your time to prepare everything, to be sure to, um, uh, to have all the information uh, in advance, and also to prepare yourself to avoid, you know, uh, doing some wrong interpretation or having a wrong interview technique. So you have to be you, yourself very prepared. Avoid collective interviews. You know, sometimes we are doing collective interviews uh, in, in research, but for e investigation is not so good because in the collective interviews, you know, people will not be, uh, uh, will not dare to report something. You know, they will be a little bit scared because there is several people. So you, you will have too much social influence in the collective interviews. You should also limit number of assistants. <laughs> I, I, I've seen in, in, air, in one airline, I will not give the, I, I will not give you the name of the airline. Uh, uh, one interviewer, but there was five assistants and there was one interviewee. So you see, you can imagine on the table, you have six persons interviewing one person. And for the person we've, who have been interviewed, it was really scared, you know, to see so much people like uh, in, a, in a jury. Uh, so avoid as much as possible, maybe to have only one or maximum two assistants to help you. Try to create a calm, comfortable location free from disruption. You know, very often when the, the investigation in, is done, I don't know, uh, on the workstation where there is a lot of noise or a lot of opportunities for interruption. Now, this is not a good way to conduct an interview. Make sure to collect personal contacts like the names, the phones, the address in case you need a follow-up. Because very often, you know, the day after when you are analyzing your data, you say, oh, I forgot to ask him this, or I need to, to get some confirmation. So you need to have the personal contact. Always, as much as possible, record the interview. It's very important. You know, we always encourage people to do a record of the interview because it will help you you know, you, are, you will be free from taking the note. And we know that taking the note 
is something which is very difficult when you are taking the note. Of course, you need also yourself to select information because you can't, of course, collect everything. So recording the interview after obtaining consent, which is, which is very important, of course, it will be very useful, very helpful to analyze and transcript uh, the information. What we, when we do uh, training uh, in my university, we ask all the students to transcript all words in the interview. So sometimes it might be very, very long. You know, for one hour of interview, it may take three or four hours to transcript everything. Now we have automatic transcription system. Probably you heard that. We, so uh, we have, we have uh, computer software that transcript automatically most of the interview. Of course, we need to correct a few errors, but it's very useful because sometimes, you know, this is in the detail that you will have the most useful information. Okay, uh, so first you need to start with personal information, you know, then question from uh, general to specific, okay? Uh, don't go directly to very specific information. So try to be very general from the beginning. It will create a trust climate, okay? And then go more and more in specific uh, information. Uh, so again, try to prompt the witness to tell everything she can remember or he, she, he can remember without influencing and pay attention also to voice intonation. You know, sometimes what we call the non-verbal, so non-verbal means your, what we call the body language is also very important. You know, the facial expression, the intonation, uh, the silences, the interruption, so the way you know, it will also give you some information that you need to interpret. Be careful also not to over interpret everything, but at least you need to consider this information when you are analyzing your uh, data. Okay, and then just to finish on that, uh, establish and maintain an interviewer interview relation. You know, you are in a professional relationship. So it means that you should not be too much familiar. Okay. Oh yeah, my friend. Okay. No, this is still a very professional relation. Do not prejudge a witness. This is sometimes very difficult because of course we have all a tendency to have a kind of judgment. You need to work against this tendency, you know, try to be as much as possible neutral be serious and take interviewing seriously, maintain the control of the interview. Sometimes, you know, when people are talking too much, <laughs> you are just losing the control of the interview. And sometimes the interview V ask you too much question. No, you are here to ask question and they are here, of course, to answer the question. It does not mean that you should not answer the question, but you need to take to keep the control. Okay, because otherwise at the end you will say, okay, I lost the control and I did not get all the information uh, I was uh, I was needed. Uh, respect the emotional state of the interview. You know, sometimes people will cry and it's quite difficult. Uh, sometimes they will be very stressed. Sometimes they will be very shy. So try to respect that. And this is very important if you want to get the most of your interview. Do not interrupt. You know, it's a very, uh, sometimes this is something that will um, deteriorate the quality of the interview. If you interrupt every time, you know, the people will not be uh, happy to answer any more questions. So be a good listener. Interviewing is being first a listener, okay? And the last thing, which probably not the least, is to avoid revealing items discovered during the interview investigation to the interview. You know, it's a, the worst case is to say, okay, so we have already interviewed a lot of people. We have a lot of hypotheses on what happened in the accident. We have even some hypotheses on the causes. And this will be the worst case. You will totally influence the interview. Okay. So you have. Uh, you, have, you should not reveal anything before the interview. Maybe you can reveal something after the interview, but not before to avoid all, uh, all of these influences. Okay, so I think we, uh, it's time maybe to uh, a coffee break, no? Yes, it is. Yes, I'm, okay, <laughs> so we can take 15 minutes. Sir. That's perfect. Yes. Okay, 15, and we will stop at uh, 10. This is 
uh, uh, no, sorry, 10, uh, this is my time. So it will, uh, no, uh, it will be 4.30 for, for you, no? Uh, so it's 3.15, you said, 3.30 for you. Uh, okay, no, yeah, I, I mean the end of the training, the end of the day today. 4.30, yeah, around 4.30. Okay, okay, we will we'll try to stop before, uh, yeah, between 4 and 4.30, okay? So we can okay. take 15 minutes of break now, so just relax a little bit. After the break, I will ask you maybe also to recap what we say, okay? Uh, the idea also is to try to uh, be sure that you uh, understood what, was, what I told you, and then also to help you to, uh, um, to remember what, what I told you. So we'll do a, a quick recap of, of what we have said from the beginning this morning, okay? Okay. So relax, 15 minutes of coffee break, and then we continue. Okay, yes, see you soon. Okay, see you soon, enjoy. <laughs> Okay, so can you see my screen? But not the full screen. Okay, yeah. as, as usual. <laughs> uh, as usual. Yeah. And now? Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Yes. Okay, so before jumping to the next uh, section, I would like just to maybe uh, do a recap with you, a, a short recap of what we have seen from the, uh, from the beginning uh, this morning, uh, especially maybe on the last uh, section, which is, uh, of course, uh, uh, very important. So I just have a few questions for you. Um, so first, uh, can you tell me what are the main uh, process, uh, the main step in the investigation process. Can someone tell me? Don't, don't, don't read your, uh, the slide, of course. <laughs> what are, there is three main steps into the investigation process. What, what are these three main steps? Uh, the three main steps of the investigation, just remember, is first is determine, determination of Consequence of the uh, the the, uh, uh, the even leading to the uh, the problems, mm -hmm. and uh, identify the sources and uh, the, the sources of of the accidents of incidents, and then try to uh, to uh, to uh, to conclusions and find out the methods to uh, to uh, minimize the problem as my occurs again in in the future. Yeah, so you, you already have been in, in, uh, yeah, in, in very specific information, but yeah, the, the three main uh, steps are uh, first the data collection, which are of course important to get some uh, data to um, try to understand what has caused or what has contributed to the uh, um, safety occurrence. Then we have the data analysis, okay, and then we have the uh, um, I mean, writing the report, so uh, reporting uh, the uh, analysis. Okay, uh, good. So, no, uh, maybe can you tell me why this is very important to separate uh, the technical investigation and the judicial investigation? And what are the purpose of the two uh, of the two investigations? What, what is it? What are the objective of these two investigations? Well, the technical comes to a uh, comes to a conclusion for the cause yes. and the method which can be used, while judge judge uh, system comes to the blaming system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, is to find you know uh, liability who is responsible. Okay, and so of course the idea at the end is to blame someone uh, here in the uh, technical investigation, and uh, I mean the training is about uh, this training is about technical investigation is not to find the responsible but to find the causes, uh, and we also um, is there, can we see a clear link between uh, errors and the consequences? Can we see a kind of uh, uh, proportionality between? errors and consequences. No, 
in other terms, can we say that uh, the bigger the errors, the bigger the consequences? No, it's negative because mm -hmm. as, uh, as we would like that, uh, I don't remember the name, but the, uh, but he said that the arrow is just like in, in two parts of the coins. So uh, in, in some part, it's, it's quite positive if you get a lot of arrows and then you, uh, you just increasing the, the, uh, the performance to correct the things. But in the opposite side, the, the errors, if you, if the people cannot manage the errors, it's my head an accident. So that is both sign of the errors, what we are focusing on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's a good answer. Yes, you're right uh, by saying that um, error, it's difficult to suppress errors because otherwise we should uh, suppress uh, the ability of people to adjust and the way they are learning um, learning a task, their job. So it's quite difficult. But what we should manage is the consequences of errors because, and you, if you remember, we have said that uh, the main causes of the consequences, okay, are not really the error by itself, but more the context in which the error occur. Okay, uh, you remember the old lady opening the window. You remember with the flowers falling down in the street. Uh, we 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 saw from this very simple example that what makes the consequences is not the error, but again the situation, the context, the fact that she is uh, on the third floor, the fact that someone is uh, walking uh, below the, the window, and so we need to consider how we can avoid the consequences of uh, error. So this is why we can't stop in the investigation to the error, okay? We need to go beyond the error. We need to understand uh, in the investigation what at, at some point uh, lead to the consequences from a single errors or from multiple errors or, uh, or violation, okay? Uh, so this is, I think, a key aspect for, the, uh, for this training. Uh, next, uh, do... Uh, what kind of limitations do we have in uh, the investigation? What, what kind of, uh, you know, problem we, we might face? What kind of issue we, we might face when we are doing investigation? Maybe bias, being biased? Yes, bias, exactly. Yes. So can you give me just, I mean, a few or even one bias? In real daily life or like in uh, airlines kind of thing, field? Oh, I mean, in any field, you know, uh, in the investigation, what kind of bias um, your investigation might be uh, exposed or what, what kind of, uh, yeah what kind of influence you may have in the investigation that may reduce the quality of your investigation? Or in other words, what kind of things you need to consider when you are doing investigation um, to be sure that what you are collecting is really, uh, I mean, close to the reality? Actually, I don't, I don't get your question. So can you rephrase it? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, uh, I told you that um, uh, when we're doing an investigation, there is several things that may influence the investigation and the quality of investigation. So um, why I would like to really emphasize now is that uh, investigation is not uh, an easy process. And we might be very much influenced by a lot of things especially the investigator, he might be influenced by several things. And we call them bias, you know, bias, B-I-A-S. Uh, okay, yes, I, I get it. So one of the examples I might be able to give you is their own experience or their yes. own like expertise. Maybe they have met the same or similar case before and yeah, they yeah. are just 
when they are looking, when they are going into the investigation, they might just think that the root cause may be exactly the same because it's a similar case. So maybe the questions and the, the directions of the questions may be leading to a root cause that they already know. So that will leave out a lot of evidence that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, and we call it also the hindsight bias. You know, the hindsight bias mean that uh, we tend to have a predefined scenario. And you are totally right by saying that sometimes they use previous experience. And this previous experience is uh, leading them into a, a scenario. And so they, are, they have a tendency to select in the investigation the data that will confirm this uh, predefined scenario rather than trying to, I mean, to open their mind to other kind of scenario, other kind of root causes. Yeah, very good. Uh, okay, and in, in general, you know, uh, investigators are also very much influenced by their own background. You know, if they have, uh, I don't know, um, more, if they are more expert in uh, engines, in, uh, I don't know, computer, in software, in regulation, or in human factors, they will have a tendency to, uh, to, to, to have um, a, a, a different perspective when they are doing investigation. Okay, now we talk about interviewing people, which is a part of the process of investigation in, in the first step of the inf investigation, which is the data collection. What kind of categories of people we can, in, uh, we can interview? There are three main categories of people which can be interviewed with different objectives for these three categories. Mm, so you, mean, you mentioned actors, right? Yes. The so people who are, who are involved, yes. Mm -hmm. so we have eyewitness. Can you, sorry, can you say it again? So we do have eyewitness. Eyewitness, uh, exactly. Eyewitness, Ab absolutely, yes. Eyewitness, actors. Yeah, so we do have the second one will be um, the operator. Yes. And the third one will be the others which is including in the accident. Yeah, or people who have been, who are familiar, you know, with the... System. So it might be... So, and so, and so you and see, so we have these three, three categories. categories. And so for these three categories, uh, we may have different objectives when we are collecting some data, okay? For the operator, so can you give me a few examples of uh, what kind of things you can expect when you are interviewing the people who have been involved directly in the incident or accident? You can ask them to describe um, the situation. The yes. weather, uh, surrounding area, how they feel about the day, and what is their kind of like yeah. um, uh, things that they do on the day and before that as well. Exactly. Yeah. But I also think that they will be traumatized by the experience. So they mm -hmm. might have a lot of kind of different um, what statements about exactly the same situations. So, yeah. Good. Okay, and what about the uh, I was, what kind of things we could uh, expect to have uh, that we can't really have from the other people or from the or from other sources of information? So you you talk here and uh, you you focus on 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 the the. Uh... Uh, the, the, um, I mean, the problem is occurring about the flights, or it's just an, 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 an normal situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. The, sorry, excuse me. Uh, yeah, because the information which is we have to uh, to collect from from the witness or from the interviewee is uh, the first thing is always the factual 
uh, information. Yeah. Uh, and 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 according to the slide, we, we were always talking about the time, uh, the time and the place of happening. Mm -hmm. like, like what time that you observe that? And, uh, it's stuff in the daytime or the nighttime, and yeah. uh, also uh, some information about the aircraft, some mm -hmm. information about the people injuries. Mm -hmm. and that, mm -hmm. that that's kind of a lot of mm, mm, a long list that <laughs> we might yes. have. To yeah, exactly. Yeah, of course, we always need to think when we are interviewing these three categories of people, you know, uh, to think what could be the most useful information they, they can get and that the other categories can't really provide. Okay, uh, so and this is also very important when you are uh, thinking about your investigation and thinking about your interviewing this three categories sometimes you maybe you don't have witnesses so of course either the, you you will don't you you don't have any um, question but sometimes you may have these three categories and so you have to think really about the kind of question you can ask uh, to these three categories then we talk about the interview process okay and i really uh, insist on the fact that interviewing someone is not really easy to do i mean this is not uh, just uh, just um, asking question and uh, writing answer okay it's much more than this uh, so you really need to have a technique what kind of techniques do we uh, do um, i show you this morning what was the name of the technique uh, the cognitive interview yeah exactly cognitive interview and what is the main um, principle of the cognitive interview what are the main principles what what we try to do and what is the uh, the objective of this cognitive interview more, uh, yes more information yes sure and how do we do that what kind of things we are using in the cognitive interview to get more um, most of the information we want to collect uh, this is uh, how it's talking about uh, how we uh, we're making the questions because there's uh, some type of questions that we, could, uh, we can ask and the way we're making the question is more important just to to get an, 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 an information that we wanted i'm sorry the sound is not so good so i can't really hear uh, what, what you said can you say it again sorry uh, to uh, to have a best result for an interview, this is uh, it's about how we're making the questions. Oh uh, yes, okay, yes, you're right. Yeah, how you are making the question is very important. But I told you also, uh, of course, the question is absolutely you are absolutely right. It's very important. But we we have also some tips in the cognitive interview to take um, to try to. Uh, uh, I mean to um, to retrieve some memories to help the interviewee to to get some memories. There was something we I, I show you this morning uh, that you can use in the cognitive interview. Um, so we have called uh, rules. Yeah, exactly the four rules. Okay, so what are the four rules? <laughs> Will be the first one is mental. Uh, yes. You, you go into the mental side of the interview and yes. you go into understanding the situations and their behavior during that time. Mm -hmm. uh, two is like you go into deep, so deep uh, reporting. Yeah, in depth reporting, exactly. Yes. You go deeper in the details of the situation. And, yes. Uh, to mention everything instead yes. of the first one. Yeah. Uh, the first one is describing the to be remember events. Mm -hmm. uh, in in the time manner or the orders. Yes. And the fourth one will be looking in different perspectives. Yes, very good. You have a very good memory. <laughs> 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 young person, young person. 
Oh, she's young, of course. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Old people, they are more difficult to remember. Yes, I, I confirm. <laughs> okay, so exactly. So these rules, you know, are meant to help people uh, to get uh, to get back some memories. Because, uh, of course, I forgot to tell you that, uh, you know, long-term memory uh, normally stored uh, unlimited information. Okay, but the problem is that sometimes it's very difficult to take back or you know to retrieve a memory. Sometimes you even don't know that we have this memory in the brain, but everything is stored. And so these rules are meant, you know, the objective of this rule is to really try to help people to pick these memories in this very big storage. Uh, uh, storage or library, if you if you if you want to have a kind of uh, metaphor, okay. So these are very important rules to use when you are doing uh, your interview. And then what we have seen uh, in the end uh, uh, this afternoon for you, yes, it's uh, some general rules or some general tips, you know. And this is all about trying to create a trust uh, climate, a confidence climate. So. The, the interviewee will be uh, uh, happy to share information as much as they can uh, remember the information. Also to try to avoid some bias like the desirability bias, you know, or avoiding some uh, um, bias due to the emotion of the uh, interviewee. So this is also uh, very important. And then we have seen some kind of question. What kind of question can we ask? You remember? We have four or five categories of question. Some of them are really uh, useful. Some of them you should avoid to ask these kind of questions. Yes, so, uh, yes, open yes. Ended. exactly. Open-ended question. So it mean, uh, so what does it mean, open-ended question? It's some kind of general questions where you can expect to have an, an, an uh, uh, a lot of information to to answer a lot of uh, general information to get for example like uh, what did you see and uh, how can you recall that yeah uh, happened so uh, another type is directed questions okay. yeah. and uh, specific questions yes very good and uh, summary yes. And uh, the last one is we, we need to avoid leading questions. Okay, very good. Yeah, yeah. So leading question, what does it mean, leading questions? It means that there is an answer in the question. So <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so this is exactly that. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, it sounds good. Okay, and so um, now what we're going to do, uh, and this is the second part of the training, uh, we are going to talk about the data analysis because now we just have the data, okay? So we gather the data coming from different sources. It might be, again, electronic uh, sources. It might be from the documentation, and it might be, of course, very often from the interview. And so once we have all this data on, on the table, we need to analyze this data. So the um, principle, oh, yes, oh, it doesn't uh, move. Uh, yes, uh, before you continue, can you remove the, the two bar, the black two bar? Uh, ah, yes. this yes. bar? Yes, uh, we also can see it kind of. Uh, we didn't see it before. Oh, now it disappeared. Yes, it's perfect. Oh, it disappeared. Okay, perfect. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I don't understand exactly the Zoom interface. You know, sometimes it's a. Uh, Difficult to, to predict. Yes. Uh, actually, I have. So no, you, you have. I'm sorry. I, yeah, sorry. Uh, I just have a question before you move on into the data analysis. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, it's just a quick one. So, actually, in the morning, you mentioned a lot about bias, being biased in like the interviews. Yes. Um, so, is there like any way or any practice that you can detect? that you are being biased? Because I think sometimes as an investigator, you don't realize that you are biased. It's just like a natural part. You know, I think bias is it's very human conscious, yeah, consciousness. So we can't help it. So is there a way to like detect it? Or like, I don't know, I, 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 yeah. Or when do you know that you're biased? Uh, very good question. Very difficult question. 
<laughs> in fact, yeah, that's, that's a good question in a way that you can't really know when you are biased. Because, of course, by definition, when you are biased, you are not conscious that you are biased. Otherwise, you are not biased. So you see, it's quite, a, a, you know, a kind of a vicious circle. So what you can just do is to try to control from the beginning this bias. So first, being aware of the bias. So this is exactly what uh, I'm trying to do by sharing with you uh, all of this bias. So because being aware is the first way uh, to be uh, to try to avoid this bias and maybe sometime to detect the probability of being biased. Uh, and then uh, all the training is about reducing the bias, okay, by uh, having a good data col uh, collection. And this is why, you know, I show you uh, a few techniques in the interview. And it will be also the case in the data analysis. You know, the data analysis will be also a way to avoid some bias which are due, which might be due, as you said earlier, uh, because, oh, yes, I, I, I already have uh, seen this kind of incident and I know the root causes. And so you are going, you, you will jump directly to, to this uh, root causes. So <clears throat> data analysis, the way you will analyze your data is also a way to try to avoid being biased. But yeah, this question, your question is quite difficult because sometimes people are, when, once they are biased, it's very difficult to know that they are biased because they are just convinced that what they are thinking is a reality. Uh, and there is a lot of things like this in psychology uh, where people have a very strong belief uh, and this is very difficult to change their belief. I don't know in Vietnam or it, <laughs> what is the situation, but you know, in France, we have a lot of discussion now about the vaccine. <laughs> I guess you have the same in, in, uh, in Vietnam, no? Yes. Some people are not really happy to be uh, vaccinated. And, uh, and, and it has been studied in psychology. Um, mm -hmm. And this is some cognitive bias uh, because they heard sometimes that uh, uh, one vaccine has killed someone, okay? Or maybe there is some side effect of the vaccine. And they just focus on that. You know, this is also a cognitive bias. And this is very difficult to change their mind. This is very difficult to convince that there is more benefits to be vaccinated than uh, taking a risk of being vaccinated. OK, so uh, this is very much studied in psychology where people are making decisions. And sometimes they are making decisions, you know, uh, not really in a rational way. And this is also, uh, uh, this is what, this is a part of their cognitive bias. Uh, this is even studied uh, in my university, for example, we have a, a master in economy and psychology. Because, you know, uh, in economy, this is all about making decisions. Uh, it's, this is all about uh, uh, interpreting data. And so there is a lot of bias in economic decision due to this cognitive bias. And so in this area, this is a, this is a very, uh, we call it behavioral economics. We try also to uh, uh, teach people on how they are making decisions and why sometimes they are, they are making wrong decisions. Okay. So now uh, going back to the data analysis, which will be the last part for today. Um, so for, uh, I will just introduce, because we, we don't have so much time uh, now, uh, I will just introduce the uh, data analysis principle, uh, give you a few, uh, a few uh, knowledge. And then tomorrow morning, I will really uh, give you more um, uh, specific information on some data analysis techniques, which are very related to uh, the models. You remember we, we, we said that we need a model when we are doing an investigation. You told me that you know the Swiss cheese model. Okay. And so to apply the Swiss cheese, you can't really apply the Swiss cheese model by itself. We need a techniques. Okay. And the techniques that apply the Swiss cheese model is called HFAX. Okay. Uh, human factor classification uh, analysis uh, system. And so this is the way to apply the Swiss cheese model. Okay, so this is a practical aspect of the data analysis. So 
now uh, data analysis. Once the data have been collected, of course, we need to analyze them. Okay, we can't just leave them like this. We need to analyze. So analyzing the data is to try to find the relationship between the data. Okay, how they are linked. You know, like uh, like on the chain. You know, you will link every part, and so this is data analysis is all about linking information. So the main principle is to work backward, as you can see here, from the occurrence, okay, the safety insurance can be incident or accident, to the antecedent until the stopping point. Because at some point, you need to stop your analysis. Okay. Let me give you a very simple uh, example. I don't know, uh, you so just, uh, I mean, an occupational accident. So very simple accident. Someone has fallen down on the ground because the ground was slippery, okay? And the, ground, and the ground was slippery because there was water on the ground, okay? And why there was uh, water on the ground? Because there was some rain, okay? It was raining. And so some water came into uh, the, the room and so the, uh, the employee fall down and uh, suffer from injury. So, of course, this is the, on the, the uh, occurrence is falling down, okay? The error is the fact that uh, the, uh, the employee, you know, uh, did not take into consideration that the ground was slippery, and so he fell down. To explain the fact that slippery, it was the water, okay? What explain the water? It's rain. You you follow me? Hello? Oh, yeah. I see. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because yeah. sometimes my my connection is not so good. So yeah. And so, do we need to explain why it rains? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Because of course, it rains. This is. I mean, this is life. Uh, we can't really change the rain, okay? Um, I know that the Chinese, you know, sometimes they are <laughs> they are sending something in the cloud, you know, to to create a rain. But yeah, normally you you don't really want to change the weather, okay? The weather is part of the life, so you don't really want to explain why it rains, okay? But what what do you want to explain in this simple incident? What you want to avoid? Do we want to avoid the error or do we want to avoid the antecedent of the error? I think we, we need to avoid the, uh, the antecedent of the errors because exactly. actually, yeah. so we have to, uh, to, uh, to, to know how, uh, how to avoid the consequence of the rain. Yeah. So making error, to stop yeah, the error. Yeah. Yeah, we even want to maybe to avoid the rains to come into the building, you know, um, and so at, and this will be the stopping rule, you know, the stopping point will be the last point, the, lo the last antecedent that we want to explain and on which we may have a control, okay, because you will never have a control on the rain, but you may have a control on the reason that explain why the water went into the building. You see my point? So it's mean that to avoid the slippery. Exactly, to avoid the slippery, okay? So we always need to have a, 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 a stopping point. This is very important, you know, because you, you can go, uh, I mean, at some point you need to, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, to think about the uh, about God, <laughs> you know? Uh, so, no. We, we want to stop at the point, at the latest point that we can control. And here, the latest point is the rain that goes into the building and not trying to explain why it rains. Because of course, if you are doing any uh, human activity, you have to live with the rain. You, you have to live with the weather. You, you have to live with very changing situation. 
But what you can control is in the system what should avoid the consequences of, of this viability on the consequences on, on the uh, I mean on, on the safety of the system. Okay, so to go maybe in more uh, to, to have a, a good uh, example of that and a little bit more complex example. Now we are going to talk about a train um, a train accident. Okay, so you see here you have a train that failed to stop at a red signal and struck another train, okay? So this is a collision between uh, two trains because one of the train didn't stop at the red signal, okay? So can you tell me what kind of things you should try to investigate to try to explain why this accident occurred? Don't look at the slide, of course. Just use your own uh, your own uh, imagination. Yes, the driver who should have controlled the train. Apart okay, from first. The right yeah. So the, the, the yeah. The so the the drivers did not control the train. So what may happen to explain why he did not control the train and he did not stop? Because of complacency, he thought the red light will automatically stop it. I'm sorry. Uh, it's yeah. like uh, not following the proper, not following the proper rules. Like you know, red light, he should control the uh, control the train. Yes, exactly. Procedures, but procedures. It, yeah, it might be yes, not a, not applying a, a procedure, but it might be also that, and maybe it may happen that the red light was not. I mean, the light was not red. You see. You, you may have a failure on the red light system. And I, I mean, this is quite interesting because we, we always jump to the human error. We, we have the tendency to see, oh, probably made an error. But maybe first, the red light was not here. OK? Uh, and so we need to investigate that. What may happen also, what may explain why the train did not stop? The braking system is failure. Exactly, braking system failure. Okay, we, we don't know. Maybe he saw the red light, the red light was here. He saw it, he brake, I mean, he, he did the action to brake, but the braking system uh, was uh, out of order. So you see, this is very important when you have this kind of event to try to list all the possible explanations. Okay, so starting by, of course, the occurrence, which is a collision. Then you need to, lo to look to investigate the locomotive operator's brake application. So lo locomotive operator means the train drivers. Uh, the locomotive operator's power reduction, because before braking, you have a power reduction. And we may have a failure at this point. It might be simply the railroad signal system maintenance and inspection. Maybe the signal was not working. And so, I mean, there was no red light. Uh, the, it might be uh, the uh, train driver initial and refresher training. It might be the railroad brake system maintenance and inspections. It might be the railroad Brake system maintenance personal selection practice. So you see, if you are going really in, in, the, uh, in the deep causes, it might be the brake system manufacturer and installation, because maybe the brake system was OK, but the way it has been installed it was not OK. Uh, it might be the railroad signal system selection and acquisition. It might be the system signal system manufacturer or the railroad signal system selection and installation. Uh, it might be the railroad signal installer maintenance and inspection personal training. It might be the locomotive, the train driver's oper operator selection. It might be uh, the railroad brake system maintenance personal practice. It might be uh, the same for the uh, signal system installer. It might be the oversight, you know, the regulator, because you have like in aviation, a regulator, that oversight. And it might be the regulator oversight of brake system. You see? So you have here 17 
items that you need at some point to investigate. So in this specific investigation, after the data collection, they found that the operators has break, you know, he did the action, he saw the red light and he did the actions to break. And so here you can, you know, um, by elimination, you know, you, you can eliminate some lead because they are not, I mean, they, they, they can really explain the accident. Okay, so this is how, I mean, this is a general approach that, that you can use is to list everything, every single thing that may explain the consequence here, the, sorry, the consequence are the collision. And from that, from your data, try to eliminate, okay, and just to keep the, the most likely uh, antecedent for the collision. You see the point? Okay, and here you have at least suppressed uh, one, two, three, four uh, antecedents, which are not, they are proved not to be involved into the accident. Okay, so how, because of course, always you have the question of how you can really uh, infer the relationship between the errors and the antecedent, because of course, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going back to this slide, you know, what you want to have in your investigation is to be as much as possible sure of the relationship between the occurrence, the error, and the antecedent. So you want to prove as much as possible the link between errors and antecedent, which is not, I mean, this is not straightforward. And so to be as much as possible sure, you need to have relationship which are logical and un unambiguous. Okay, by, by asking you the question, would the accident have occurred if the errors has not been committed? Okay, uh, and so by asking yourself the question, by testing this hypothesis, you will be sure that you have a clear relationship uh, between your errors and the antecedent. Okay. Would the operator have committed the error if the antecedent had not preceded it? So it will help you also to confirm that your errors has been produced by the antecedent. And so to do that, I mean, there is no magic bullet to do that. There is no books that will give you all the relationship. It has to be based, of course, at some point to, on your experience. And it has to be based also on statistical relationship between the antecedent and the critical error. What, do, what, does, what, does I, what do I mean here? Uh, the fact that there is a very high risk or a very high probability that the errors and the antecedent are, uh, um, are uh, linked, okay? And there is a high probability that this relationship is not due to the effect of change. So this is what we call a statistical relationship. And so for that, you need also to use your own experience. Uh, you need also to use some previous uh, events, occurrences that try to help you to see how much this uh, relationship is not due to the effect of change. Okay, of course, sometimes you may have multiple Antecedent. What I mean by multiple antecedent is that one error might be due to the interactions between different interaction uh, between different antecedent. Why? Because in complex system, accidents are generally related to a combination of antecedent. You know, uh, I give you the example. I gave you the example of uh, someone uh, falling down uh, on the ground because the the ground was slippery. The link between the error, the occurrence, the error, and the antecedent are quite linear. So, you know, it's very easy to see some clear link. But in a complex accident, I don't know, in an aircraft accident or in a cabin accident, where you have several things that interact between procedures, between uh, human errors, between uh, uh, technical failures, you know, it's much more complex. And so multiple antecedent can increase each antecedent influence on performance. I will give you a very simple example. So it means that 
two plus two might be more than four. You know, you, you have a kind of uh, additive effect between um, in the interaction between antecedent. So I will give you a very simple example. Uh, a bus driver fell asleep and the bus ran off the road and struck a truck. Okay, it's quite easy to understand. And the investigation found three cumulative antecedent to explain why the driver was really drowsy while he was uh, driving. First, he was taking anti-histamine. Uh, anti you know, when you have a flu, you are taking anti-histamine, and anti-histamine are known to provoke uh, drowsiness. He also, uh, from the investigation, they found that he wrote several consecutive night duties. And we have... We have seen uh, this morning that uh, walking at night uh, will reduce the quality and the quantity of your sleep and so will produce more drowsiness while you are on duty. And the last factor is a circadian factor. You remember the term circadian? The accident occurred at 4 a.m., 4 in the morning, which is the uh, lowest point in the circadian factor, meaning that at 4 in the morning, or performance are at the lowest, or vigilance, or alertness, or cognitive function are running at the lowest point. Okay? So you see that if you take each of these uh, antecedent, antihistamine, working several consecutive night duties, or accident time, they can just uh, isolated explain why, why the driver has been drowsy. But if you put them together, it will produce a very high risk of being drowsy, okay? Because you have three conditions that by themselves produce drowsiness, but if you are putting them together, they will, you know, uh, create a very high effect. This is what we call interaction. Interaction means that you have additive effect and that it will, you know, create a higher effect, um, uh, which is higher than just the addition of these effects. Okay, is that clear? So this is why when you are collecting your antecedent, you need to see how much this antecedent may have provoked the accident and how much this antecedent may have, you know, interacted uh, together. And so I think yeah, we have a few uh, examples. So two or more antecedents together affect performance differently than the antecedent would have if acting on their own. Okay, so putting them together have a higher effect than their only uh, isolated effect. And so the variety of human behavior, you know, in human factors, we know that uh, people are very difficult to predict. Uh, they are very much variable because we are adjusting every time. Uh, even, I don't know, just to take a simple example, the way I'm doing the training today would be very different from the way I will do the training tomorrow, you know, because it will change depending on the people, depending on the participant, depending on my fatigue also. So you see, we are always different, not always acting in the same way. So the variety of human behavior, the process, the training, the equipment, that the total number of interacting antecedent is, I mean, virtually infinite. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Sometimes. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah, because I saw, uh, I have a warning saying that my internet connection is, is not so good. So maybe sometime it may uh, cut what I'm saying. Okay, so. No, okay. It's okay, perfect. Uh, so just to give you uh, two examples, uh, the operator experience interact with equipment and procedure, okay? It means that depending on the experience, if you have a high experience or a low experience, the way you will use equipment and procedure will be different. Um, oversight, you know, when you are doing, uh, when you are a manager, you are oversighting people, you are supervising people. We know that it interacts with managerial experience. We know that, for example, less experienced operators may perform 
best with extensive experience, oversight, sorry, because you know these people, they don't have experience, so they, they, they require more oversight. But experienced operators, so people who have a lot of experience, may perform best with little oversight. So you see here, the same antecedent will have a different impact on another antecedent. Okay, so you, you see, it starts to be a little bit complex, but it means that you can just say that, okay, I have a list of antecedents and they will all have exactly the same effect. No, you need to consider the effect of all antecedents in the context of all the other antecedents. I mean, th does it make sense for you? <laughs> so is that, does that mean that we, we compared uh, different antecedents or we compare specific antecedents to the other antecedents in the whole complex? Yeah, you, I, it means that you need to consider, you know, when you have different antecedents, the fact that you may have, um, you may have big impact, uh, greater impact when you are putting together these antecedents. And so this is the things you need to, at some point, try to analyze. And, and I mean, uh, having a good data analysis will be about, you know, creating the link between the occurrence, errors, antecedents. And so you need to consider the multiple antecedents, which are, I mean, and the multiple antecedents are really what we call the, real, the root cause of the accident. This is where you have, you know, all the explanation, all the more detailed explanation of your accident, and this is what this is where you need to work. Okay, so again, I would like just to go back on this slide. Very often, you know, uh, before, you know, maybe I don't know, twenty years ago, in investigation, people had a tendency to stop here. You know, they say, okay, oh, okay, we have the occurrence, we find the error. And so the explanation of the accident is these errors. And so if we just think about that, can you tell me what could be uh, the prevention, uh, you know, the way to prevent this accident to occur if you stop at the errors level? What, what, can, what kind of things can we recommend to try to avoid, I mean, the uh, occurrence of the error? But for that, we can, uh, if we look at only the error, so we just can stop uh, things happen uh, with the, in the very, very much the same situation than, than this kind of things. But uh, we mm -hmm. didn't find out the root cause. Mm, exactly. So, so yeah. for, for the general, so that is no, uh, I mean, that that general look really that we cannot stop all the other things, all the other situation that might a little bit different than, than, than the original one. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. This is a very good point because, and also because errors, you know, is something that may happen one time, okay, during this incident. But what you want to, I mean, to really to tackle and to manage is something which is really in your system. You know, errors is just a symptom. This is something that may happen, that may disappear uh, the next day. What you want to see is something which is much more stable in your system and that produces the accident, okay? And errors is only one part of the explanation, okay? Uh, and also, very often, you know, when uh, I, I, I read some investigation which are really based only on human factors and especially on, only on human errors, I mean, the very quick uh, conclusion was to say, oh, we need to train people. <laughs> we need to improve our training. Uh, and this is just an illusion. You can train people for years, you know, and probably you will not suppress errors. Or sometimes, the, also the other conclusion is to say, oh, we need to write another procedure. And so you will add procedure on over, over 
existing procedures over existing procedure. And so at the end, you will have, you know, uh, 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 a lot of procedures. And here you are making your system even more and more complex. And you are even provoking more opportunities for people to have, uh, I mean, to, to create a link between errors and accident because your system start to be too complex. Okay, so this is why really uh, uh, there was some kind of uh, evolution on the uh, on the way we are investigating uh, the root cause is to go to the antecedent and not stopping at the errors level. Okay, so to do that, and it will be, I mean more or less the end uh, for today. Uh, yeah, because I, I don't want to, to give you too much information. We need to use models and methods. And this is, again, this is a way also to fight against bias. Again, we, because we have seen that, that there is a lot of bias. And also to help you to explain the link between the antecedent and the errors. Okay, so why do we need models and methods? Exactly for the reason I just said. So we need uh, to use we accident models describe the theory of accident. Okay, while um, the analysis method, which is different, guides the investigator to establish the relationship between the event, the errors, and the antecedent. Okay, so the method is something that you are going to use. This is a tool. The, the model is the theory. And of course, the theory, you can't really apply the theory. You need a tool. And so the tool is the analysis method. So a method should be supported by a model. So like I, I told you earlier, HFAX, human factors analysis classification system is the analysis method. And this method is supported by a model, which is a Swiss cheese model. Okay. And tomorrow morning, I will explain you, you know, the main series and the main method, which are, which are supporting this uh, series. And so accident uh, models and methods are crucial. In all possible. <laughs> you know, so so the guys that yeah, you told you know, the facts that oh, yeah. I know. Um, Philip. Anh chị xem cái mạng nó yếu quá rồi, tôi không nghe được cái gì luôn. Thấy ông hả hỏng không nè? Bạn có thấy? Không phải. Đến giờ ăn tối rồi. Đến giờ. Bây <cười> okay. giờ này là cái giờ rất là nhiều người vào mạng á. Cho nên là giờ này là giờ yếu lắm. Bây giờ ngay cả mail biết là cũng không vào được luôn đây nè. Philip? Rồi, đi ăn trưa rồi. Đi ăn. Đúng rồi, giờ này giờ của thầy Big Lunch. Chắc là nói thầy mai mình rút kinh nghiệm 4 giờ mình nghỉ. Giờ này không có vào được, không thật đấy. Thà là một buổi trưa mình nghỉ ít thôi rồi buổi chiều mình nghỉ sớm hay hơn. Nói nó không nghe gì. Ý kiến của mình thôi nha, không biết là các chị có đồng ý hay không. Không, không, không biết người đồng ý đâu. <cười> không, không nghe được. Bên thầy... Ao kìa. Bị ao luôn rồi, thầy bị ba bay ra ngoài rồi. I think we need to start an investigation now. <cười> Okay, I will. I will investigate why the internet is disconnect. <laughs> the first cause is I think uh, the instructor is tired. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I thought so. He talked a lot. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. <laughs> he do talk a lot. Philip, Philip. Yes, I'm here now. I, I want back. to make an investigation why the internet disconnected. <laughs> <laughs> so you have three hours to do the investigation. <laughs> you, can, you can interview myself, okay? <laughs> yeah, the occurrences. The occurrences were yeah. the instructor missing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I guess it was not a human factors uh, <laughs> cause. It's, it was more a technical issue. Sorry, my Wi-Fi uh, uh, connection was disconnected. 
and so yeah. it tried to connect again, but uh, okay. So yeah, sorry for that. Technical, technical problem, not technical a human problem. error. <laughs> no, no, not, but, not human error. <laughs> but one of the antecedent was that that the instructor may be tired the of incident, the whole day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. Yes, yeah, the, 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 the trainer is too, it's too much tired. <laughs> so it was, it was probably a, a contributory uh, factor. Okay, so let me just finish uh, the last slide for today, and then we will uh, we will break for today. Uh, okay, so I try to share my screen, which is not easy as usual <laughs> uh, because I lost Zoom. Okay, uh, okay, okay, okay. Yes, it should be. Uh, Okay. Okay, so you can see my screen, but maybe not in full. Yes, not in full. That's not in full. So I switch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay, perfect. So, uh, so I don't know what, what you heard from uh, what I, because maybe I was just talking. Uh, <laughs> for myself because it was disconnected uh, but i guess you you understand you know the difference between a model and a, and a method okay the model is a theory the the method is how you apply the theory you know in a very practical way okay so still we have some limitation even if you know uh, if this improve or reduce some limitation like uh, subjectivity some cognitive bias Still, the, investigator, the investigator has to be aware that the methods are always a simplification. You know, when you are using the Swiss cheese model, I mean, you don't have <laughs> in the reality is always much more complex. Okay, so be aware of that. Be aware that this is not a magic tool that will solve every problem and that will bring uh, directly the root cause. Okay, it's a it's it's something that will help you but it will not make the job uh, at your place, okay? You still need to use a lot of your expertise, a lot of knowledge. This is just a way to uh, improve the way you are doing the investigation. And also the investigator should not adhere rigidly to the method. It means that sometimes you, you need to be flexible. Sometimes even you need to use maybe two methods. And, uh, and by having you know, two methods, by comparing the result of the two methods, you may uh, try to validate uh, the results of your investigation. Okay, so tomorrow, just to give a, a little bit of teasing for tomorrow, we will review more or less these uh, models. Okay, so this is models. Uh, we have models and methods. Okay, you see more or less they, are, they have been classified in three generations uh, the simple linear model the complex linear model and the complex non-linear model. So you see, you have, a, you have different level of complexity. This is the most uh, easier approach and this is a more complex approach to try to investigate accident, okay? So tomorrow, what we are going to do, we are reviewing this method and, and models. And then I will introduce you two methods, which are HFAX, human factors analysis and classification system, which is the application of the Swiss cheese model, okay? And we're gonna talk of the bowtie risk uh, management, the incident bowtie, what we call the incident bowtie. Maybe some of you already know the bowtie because it's quite used in the industry. And so what we're going to do is to explain you the principle of this method, and then we are going to do the training mostly on uh, based on the group exercise. So you will have will have these two methods, and I will give you three accident cases. And so we will have to uh, do six groups, okay? And each group will use one method based uh, to uh, to investigate one accident, okay? So tomorrow will be a little bit of theory in the morning, and then it will be 100% uh, of uh, group exercise. Uh, we'll have to think about uh, 
how we will uh, doing the group because you are you, we have a lot we have a lot of participants uh, uh, almost 50 participants which is a lot of participants uh, we will need to to have six uh, balanced groups you know the, the uh, more or less the, the same number of people in each of the six groups. and some of you are in the room some other are in uh, online so we need to see how we'll organize that but we'll talk with uh, uh, Anne and Mr. Tien, or we'll organize everything. Okay? So, do you have any question? Or do you want me to clarify something? Or uh, do you find everything uh, uh, clear, easy to understand? <clears throat> Are you all sleeping? <laughs> <laughs> not yet? Not yet, not yet. Not yet, okay. now. <laughs> okay okay so we will we'll see tomorrow morning yes yes at nine vietnam time and 3 a.m for you exactly wow <laughs> yes you get a free tea, be, yeah? yeah yeah i will be happy to see you again uh, in the middle of the night yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay so thank you so much for uh following uh, the the training and see you tomorrow morning yes. okay see you Okay, enjoy your evening. Yes. Okay. Okay. okay.